Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the ninth lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. Okay. Uh, in the last two lectures, we have started Max Weber's interpretation of modernity and we have discussed certain uh, prefatory remarks about uh, Weber's interpretation of modernity. I mean we have discussed Weber's theoretical positions and uh, uh, methodological writings which are extremely important to make sense of his contributions to the debates on modernity. Okay. We have discussed, I mean in within uh, sociological modernism, I mean classic statements of sociological modernism in the works of Marx and Weber. We have already completed Marx. <coughs> and in the last two lectures, uh, in the seventh and eighth lecture, we have discussed uh, Weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings. Uh, I mean, how they are uh, usually characterized as effecting uh, a reconciliation between positivism and neo Kantianism. I mean, positivism. Uh, indicates the supremacy of sciences over non sciences. Uh, positivism suggests that science is the most objective thing known to human species. Uh, uh, whereas, neo Kant, I mean, positivism suggests that our knowledge is absolute, uh, uh, science must, must be accorded, an esoteric value, say, value system. Uh, uh, in contradistinction with uh, other areas of human activity or creativity. Okay. I mean we have already discussed how positivism suggested that, uh, that uh, science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity, because it possesses a method unique to it. That there is only one method, that there is only one single method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter, that is methodological monism, that the method of science is the method of induction that the hallmark of science uh, lies in the fact that um, uh, all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable that is systematic that is systematic verifiability. Okay. We have also discussed uh, how that uh, positivism maintains that there must be a dichotomy between fact and value. I mean facts. Uh, are value neutral, whereas values do not have any factual content. Uh, uh, the relationship between observation and theory is unilateral in the sense that uh, theories are observation dependent, whereas observations are theory independent. In other words, observation leads to theory but the converse is not true. I mean theory does not lead to observation. Okay. Such absolutist, idealist characterization of science was questioned by neo Kantian school of thought. Okay. What does the neo Kantianism suggest? No, our knowledge of the 
the natural world as well as the social world is not absolute, is relative, is partial, okay. it is not subjective, it is sorry, it is not objective, rather it is subjective. That is why our knowledge of the social world is, is a constructed one, which involves selection and, uh, and interpretation of multiple data systems. And we do not simply uh, uh, remain at the level of interpretation of multiple data systems, okay. as Weber said that no, we also aim at interpretation of interpretations. Okay. That is very important. Okay. Then, then Weber's methodological writings and theoretical positions are usually characterized as effecting a reconciliation between positivism and neo-Kantianism, we have already discussed. Uh, at times, Weber rejects certain viewpoints of neo-Kantians that the cultural sciences are exclusively concerned with the uniqueness of their objects of study and that the category of causality is inapplicable in them. At the same time, Weber was committed to neo-Kantian insistence on the methodological peculiarities of the cultural sciences. I mean by foregrounding the distinction between natural sciences from cultural sciences. For Weber, these methodological peculiarities centered around two related concepts, namely value relevance and interpretative understanding. For, for Weber, the cultural sciences differ from the natural sciences in the distinctive role of valuations in the formation of concepts, I mean in and in the distinctive type of knowledge involved in them. Then, Another third area of methodological differences was thought by Weber okay, to be the use of idealizations, idealizations within quote, idealizations in the cultural sciences. Okay. We have discussed this. Then Weber made another leap by, by, by defining sociology as a science. He, he, he was no, nevertheless very much aware of the ambiguities involved in, in, in the term sociology, uh, 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 but, 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 but he defined sociology as a science which attempts the interpretive understanding of social action in order thereby to arrive at a causal explanation of its course and effects. And that is why we have, we have discussed how an exposition of Weber's methodological positions and theoretical positions can usefully proceed with an analysis of each of the concepts and contrasts involved in this definition of sociology. I mean three important uh, components, sociology is a science, sociology is a secondly, sociology is a science which attempts interpretive understanding of social action and thirdly a causal explanation, I mean cause and effect relations. Then we, we, we have discussed the concept of social action, uh, I mean the characterization of sociology in terms of the understanding and explanation of social action, which involves two important contrasts. When I say understanding, I refer to neo-Kantianism, when I uh, 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 discuss explanation, um, I refer to positivism. Okay. What kind of two important contrasts? No uh, important contrast between the paradigmatic objects of sociological knowledge for Weber uh, uh, on the one hand and supra individual social entities on the other. When what, what, what are those paradigmatic uh, objects of sociological knowledge for Weber? Now, those individual social actions, their meanings and causes. And what are those supra individual social entities? for Weber, you know, states, institutions, uh, classes, collective consciousnesses and so on, whose existence is supposed in much sociological theory and also um, everyday thinking about social relations. Okay. Uh, and, and Weber was, uh, Weber in fact, uh, in fact though, um, uh, though methodological individualist position Weber undertakes. Okay. Weber does not actually deny the existence of such supra individual social entities, but argues that for interpretative sociology, 
these supra individual social entities must be treated as solely the resultants and modes of organizations of the particular acts of individual persons in contradistinction with what marx said it is uh, i mean for for uh, whatever social change that we we witness it is because of the changes in the modes of production by by collective social action not individual persons for marx but for weber it is it is uh, the resultant and uh, mode of organization of the particular acts of individual persons that's why uh, his his position uh, uh, is often regarded as methodological individualist which involves the claim that so far as collectivities may be said to have characteristics independent of the individuals which make them up those characteristics are to be explained in terms of individual actors and their actions okay then we have discussed methodological individuality which refers to theoretical positions holding that adequate sociological accounts necessarily involve reference to individuals their interpretations of their uh, circumstances and the reasons and uh, and motives for the actions those individuals take suppose suppose for 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 marx such such action such individual social action or collective action by no means necessarily follows from uh, I, i mean for marx it it always it necessarily follows from the sharing of a common class situation but not for weber for weber such action by no means uh necessarily follows from the sharing of a class situation it may be status it may be party it may be market and so on okay then then in uh, then we we discussed interpretative understanding by by max weber i mean interpretive sociology refers to a variety of forms of sociology united by an emphasis on the necessity for sociologists to grasp or understand or interpret Uh, uh actors meanings subjects meanings okay it can legitimately interpret the course of action in terms of concepts such as the state classes and so on without commitment to any of these you know, any of of such entities that's why for 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 weber uh interpretative understanding refers to a method that emphasizes on the importance of understanding of intentional human action instrumental rationality goal oriented social action okay okay then such understanding that interpretative understanding of social action uh, such understanding in german it is called verstehen which weber used verstehen refers to a method of elucidating the motivations for action which did not prelude the sociologist making generalizations from the data in a nutshell whilst there is a general commitment to empathy i mean understanding the need of the other understanding the role of the other and understanding from the actor's point of view the research that follows from interpretation or multiple interpretations is so varied as to be difficult to categorize as a school of thought there may be multiple schools of thought okay that was the view of the verstehen school of thought in austria maybe perhaps because the the meaning of interpretation is itself subject to interpretation aiming at interpretation of interpretations i mean aiming at multiple interpretations okay that's why verstehen is not a method at all for weber but an objective a goal an achievement it is a distinctive type of knowledge which may be achieved by a variety of methods or no method at all for weber the concept of verstehen refers primarily to the spontaneous and immediate recognition of acts and their meanings in everyday life for according to weber interpretative understanding of social action has 
two components, two parts, two elements. What are those elements? Interpretation of the textual and linguistic meaning of a cultural product, we have, we have discussed uh, in the context of uh, any festival, uh, that is why I gave you the example of Mekla Sadi uh, uh, in, in Assam. Mm. These are cultural products and certain textual and linguistic meanings are attached to it. On that is the I mean interpretation of the textual and linguistic meaning of a cultural product on the one hand and value interpretation which does not involve evaluation of selection, uh, uh, evaluation of action or product, but involves selective conceptualization of the object in relation to some value on the other. What, are, what do we mean by such value? It may be mm, social value or aesthetic value or cognitive value. Okay. When I say value interpretation or values, it is a combination of cultural relevance and meanings that they generate as well as that which are attached to it. Okay. When I say selective conceptualization of the object, what is the basis of selection? Why, how do we select? Selection is based on cultural relevance and values in the modernist construction, in the modernist construal okay, for, a, for a social scientist, for a sociologist is always an object of study. Hence, interpretative understanding of social action when I say there are two types of interpretative understanding of social. One is direct understanding alternatively known as observational understanding and the other indirect understanding or alternatively known as uh, explanatory understanding. Okay? Then what is direct uh, understanding uh, or observational understanding of social action? It is based on the interpretative understanding of action. It involves a method or a strategy. What is that method or strategy? No, that, that method or strategy refers to the imaginative identification, which is primarily to be spontaneous and immediate recognition of the acts and their meanings in everyday life. I mean, this then what is this imaginative identification? No, this imaginative identification is processed through rule governed strategy within a shared culture, which is possible only when both observer and observed share culture. What is then that rule governed strategy within a shared culture? I mean rule governed shared culture? No, rule governed shared culture is based on relevance, acceptability and elegance. Okay? We have discussed this. Okay? Then, then what we, we just now discussed that uh, uh, this imaginative identification is processed through rule governed strategy within a shared culture, which is possible only when both observer and observed share culture, but if they do not share culture, then what will happen? Then observer may give a different meaning or observed should get socialized into the culture that the observer wants to study. Okay? That will give some uh, different results. Uh, 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 I mean, it may it may uh, uh, give us uh, uh, it may give us some unreliable data, invalid data. Okay. Then, sharing culture, shared culture, rule governed strategy within a shared culture. We have discussed. But what is culture for Weber? For Weber, culture refers to the totality of real objects to which we attach generally acknowledged values or complexes of meaning constituted by values in contradistinction with Marx. Marx said the rational is the real. For Weber, no culture is the totality of real objects to which we attach generally acknowledged values or complexes of meaning constituted by values. In this sense, culture consists of all those items produced by human beings for the sake of value ends. I mean both value rational social action as well as goal oriented social action. Okay? 
Okay. I mean such understanding, such Verstehen comprises two things. One is imaginative identification, which is useful, but not an essential condition for an for a meaningful social action. Okay. What is a meaningful social action? We'll we'll discuss when we'll be discussing typology of social acts by by uh, Weber. Okay. And we must be able to recognize the rational connection between means and ends. We must be able to recognize the rational connection between substantive rationality on the one hand and instrumental rationality on the other. And, and while coming to indirect understanding of social action or explanatory understanding of social action, Weber suggested that explanation must be adequate at the level of meaning as well as explanation must be adequate at the level of statistical generalizations. Then what is the basis of adequacy? Who will determine what is adequate, what is not adequate? No, adequacy is based on generalizations and, and generalizations are based on experience. He comes back to, I mean if, if meaning is represented by, uh, if, if, uh, If, if meaning is represented by uh, mm, uh, or, or, or meaning represents neo Kantian position, then, then, uh, uh, then statistical generalizations represent uh, positivistic school of thought. Okay? But when Weber suggests that no adequacy is based on generalizations and generalizations are based on experience, then he becomes a positivist, an empiricist, an inductivist. Ah, this is the thing. Okay. Then we have discussed there is a probability that a particular action often occurs in the same way. If if motives are the, the antecedent, then social action will be the consequent. We have also discussed motive, how multiple motives can lead to a similar and same kind of social action. I mean motive when Weber said he refers to a complex subjective meaning which seems to the actor herself or himself or to the observer as an adequate ground for the conduct in question. And the central dimensions of Weber's analysis are that economic, religious and power relations are crucial sociological explanations, thereby he made three types of economic phenomena, namely economic phenomena, economically relevant phenomena and economically conditioned phenomena. Within economic phenomena, he gave the examples of institutions deliberately created and used for uh, economic ends, I mean market economically relevant phenomena, he referred to legal and religious phenomena which are not primarily economic, but have consequences which are economic in nature in certain circumstances. And economically conditioned phenomena, Weber refers to stratification systems and the state which are not directly um, uh, the economic phenomena, but they are affected in some way by economic phenomena. By doing this, he suggested that economy and religion cannot be separated in our day to day life. Uh, and so on. Okay. Now, in this lecture, what we are going to do against this backdrop, I, I always try to recapitulate whatever we have discussed in the last lecture. Okay. Uh, now, we are going to uh, uh, um, uh, characterize, I mean, I mean uh, we, we have to capture uh, Weber's interpretation of modernity through the lenses of uh, four central philosophical and political foundations of modernity, okay? uh, namely holism or totality, uh, 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 reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Okay? Now, let us start with holism or totality. Let me tell you that Marx is not a uh, 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 sociologist in the disciplinary sense for the simple reason is that he is not an academic person. Rather, Weber is or rather became a sociologist because he is living and working as an academic at the point where sociology is developing as a separate discipline in, in the American tradition. Okay. Indeed, uh, indeed, Weber moves from the study of law political economy and history to an identity as a sociologist. And, and this has uh, and such such shift has 
uh, has significant consequences. Whereas, whereas Marx, the activist thinker, is working towards a global theory which renders the old disciplinary division of labor obsolete, outdated by showing the interrelation between the different spheres of life, Weber sets out to define sociology as different from other humanities and social sciences as uh, I mean and restricts its scope in theory at least, at least in theory. Okay? Uh, more perhaps than any comparable sociological theorist to the point where we are to hold ourselves to his explicit statements, it would be uh, impossible to describe him as a holist. Okay? There are, there are, there are, there are, I mean, um, the way Marx uh, uh, extended the scope of so uh, collective consciousness intellectual and political consciousness which have which which has contributed to the debates on uh, debates on modernity okay makes him actually in fact he extended the scope and ambit of modernity that is why he is often referred to as a holist his explanations are often referred to as a holist as as holist holistic explanations whereas whereas uh, uh, um, if you if you look at Weber, who sets out to define sociology as a science that aims uh, 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 that aims at interpretive understanding of social action, okay, in order thereby to arrive at a causal explanation of its course and effects, okay, that's why he 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 tried to branch sociology out from other spheres of other disciplines within humanities and social sciences and thereby he attempted to restrict the scope and ambit of sociology at least uh, in theory and more perhaps than any other any comparable sociological theorist to the point where we are to hold ourselves to his explicit statements. Uh, 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 I mean, it would be impossible to describe him as a holist. Okay, there are there are there are a number of steps in this narrowing of the jurisdiction of sociology. Firstly, Weber takes what is known as a methodologically individualist position, as we have already discussed. In, please try to. Uh, uh, understand that methodologically individualist position when I say uh, I refer to at least three components I mean individuals, individual actors, individual actions to uh, the circumstances against the backdrop of which uh, individuals undertake those actions and thirdly the motives and reasons for which individuals undertake such acts. Okay. These three things are important. Okay. Then, when I said firstly Weber takes what is known as a methodologically individualist position. In other words, Weber assumes that all statements about the human world can in principle be, re, uh, be reduced to statements about individuals and aggregates of individuals. When, he, when, when Weber talks about individualism, okay, uh, he always emphasizes on only individuals individuals actions, uh, individual actors, um, uh, individual uh, action uh, uh, in context, in perspective, I mean in, in, uh, in certain circumstances and the reasons and motives of such, such individual action. I mean for Weber, he treats individuals and as primary, not the relationships between individuals. 
for Marx an individual is not very important rather the relationships that individuals forge in society okay, assume greater significance for Marx, but for Weber I mean Weber treats individuals rather than relationships between individuals as prime. Okay. For Weber relationships between individuals uh, is not as important as individuals themselves. A consequence of such such analysis, okay. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, if 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 it implies treating individuals rather than relationships between individuals as primary, a consequence of this is that that uh, these relationships depend on active construction that they do not necessarily apply globally and that even where they do apply they can best be described in terms of the probability that the relationship or process in question will apply in a particular case. Okay. Secondly, secondly why he is he, he, he is uh, I mean why Weber's statements cannot be uh, considered holistic explanations precisely because uh, uh, precisely because Weber restricts the scope and <coughs> scope and ambit of sociology as a discipline to the study of meaningful social action. Putting it succinctly to the to the action of these individuals in so far as their action is oriented towards each other and in so far as they attach meaning to it. Okay. If this is so, then it involves an exclusion of biology of the unconscious potentially of some economic relationships and so on. And this position, this position is stated in detail in the opening section of Weber's work on you know, basic concepts in sociology. So, so Weber is not a straightforward holist. Weber undermines both the possibility of general explanations and the scope and ambit of sociology and the social itself to a very great extent. However, this theoretical refusal of, of holism is undermined by a number of features of his thinking. Okay, this is very important. Okay. Uh, I mean, when you, when you look at uh, uh, different types of things, you will find that uh, Weber is also a holist, but where we are where trying to challenge that uh, which is a modern phenomenon that I must be able to interrogate or I will be I will perish. Civilization must interrogate or perish. Okay. Modernity must interrogate or there is no significance of modernity. Right? Modernity uh, I mean the, the way uh, multiple modernities uh, alternate uh, uh, um, alternatives to uh, linear view of modernity uh, alternatives to European modernity. If you look at okay, uh, you will find that, that uh, we always tend to question, we always tend to interrogate the hitherto existing ideas. Okay. In this sense, in this sense we, we argue that Weber is not a straightforward holist, okay. but it does not imply that he is not absolutely a holist. No, he, he is not a straightforward holist. Okay. Through different parameters, he ca his works also can be uh, considered holistic explanations, okay. considered to have holistic explanations. Okay. If this is so, then we must link what is the, the rational position that uh, Weber took. Okay. The first and most obvious of, of, of these, these, these uh, questions is this, that there, is, that there is a tension between the statement that, that 
we start from individuals rather than relationships and the statement that we are what we are interested in is the way whose individuals orient their uh, uh, in the way those individuals orient their action to each other in other words their interaction. That is what we have discussed just now I mean Weber always treats individuals as primary not the relationships between individuals or among individuals. Okay. Uh, if, if this is so the effect of this this if the effect of uh, the way Weber treated individuals as primary becomes clear when we consider the second element of Weber's definition of sociology that it is not just about social action, but about meaningful social action. Okay. He Weber, Weber proceeds to develop a categorization of the types of meaning which can be attached to social action. What is that uh, uh, categorizes? Okay. This, this categorization uh, which appears in some senses as a general statement of the kinds of ways in which people can relate to one another or in other words precisely the kind of general statement about social relationships that that methodological individualism finds suspect. Then what are these the, the categorization of the types? You know, these types of social action reappear in a number of forms for example, as the different ways in which a given power structure can find legitimacy. Okay. For, for, for Weber, there are four types of social acts, traditional social acts, affective or emotive social acts, value oriented social acts okay, and goal oriented social acts or goal rational social acts. What is the what do we mean by these four types of social acts? Okay. Traditional social action refers to the fact that meanings of action are related simply to habit and custom and are described by Weber as coming close to having no meaning because unreflected. Traditional social action is based on habits and customs. Okay. Uh, what is a habit? As uh, A. S. Hornby, uh, uh, who writes uh, Oxford Dictionary of Social uh, Oxford Dictionary of English, okay. For A. S. Hornby, according to A. S. Hornby, a habit is something that an individual has been doing it for a long time usually. In other words, a habit is something that an individual gets accustomed to. Okay. They do not have clearly defined objectives. Okay. Suppose your custom the way we perform our uh, customs, festivals, marriages, these are important, I am not denying that. But is there a clearly defined objective? For Weber, no. That is why traditional social action is very much based on habits and customs and hence they are meaningless they, they do not have any meaning and hence unreflective in nature, they are not reflexive, they are not meaningful social acts. We are, we are coming to what is uh, meaningful social action for Weber, why was he emphasizing more and more on meaningful social acts. Okay. Then secondly, effective or emotive social action relates to the emotions 
and is equally seen as often meaningless in these terms. Okay? I mean affective or emotive social action which is based on affection, emotion, okay, it becomes unreflective in nature and hence loses its meaning, it becomes meaningless for Weber. Okay? The, the, the major distinction of clearly meaningful action then is between the last two categories, the value rational and the goal rational. Okay. Value rational action treats action as having a value in itself which is independent from its uh, effect and derives for example, from more moral, aesthetic or religious criteria. Okay? I mean when I say when Weber said value rational, I mean it is based on values which are uh, uh, known as uh, higher ordered norms. Uh, if I say speak the truth always honesty is the best policy, they are values. If I say walk on the left hand side of Indian roads, I mean in Europe people walk on the right hand side of the road, okay. that is why I said walk on the, I mean this is a rule, this is a rule which is legally bound, okay. this is a norm, it is well accepted by by the uh, uh, by the citizens, okay. By the passengers, it is also it has evolved through social acceptance. Also. It is well accepted. Okay, if I say this, then there is a difference between value and value on the one hand and rule or norm on the other. Then, then the value rational social action is very much based on values. Honesty is the best policy, I may follow that, I may not follow that. But if I say no walk on the left hand side of Indian roads, then I am legally bound to follow that. That is a rule, that is not a value. But when I say value, it, it, it is very much related to the world of morality, ethics, aesthetics and religious criteria okay, for, for Weber. Okay. Then Weber dwelt upon goal rational social action. Okay which is alternatively known as instrumental rationality, I mean action that is oriented purely towards desired results. Okay? Okay? Action that is purely toward, uh, pure, uh, uh, that is oriented purely towards desired results. I mean goal rational social action or instrumental rationality involves a specific goal, objective, aim and so on. And particularly this goal rational social action is associated with Weber's account of modernity, which he sees uh, action as deriving uh, which he sees as a, as a, a, a de, uh, which he sees action as deriving its sole meaning and interest from its results to dominate um, all contemporary society i mean i mean which he sees um, if i have to say i mean i mean goal oriented social action or goal rational social action alternatively known as instrumental rationality okay, uh, is oriented purely towards desired results, 
which is particularly associated with Weber's account of modernity, which Weber sees as a progressive extension of this principle of instrumental rationality, which sees action as deriving its sole meaning and interest from its results to dominate all contemporary society. Okay? For, for Weber, the, the history of modernity is the history of the progressive orientation of all social action in all contexts to instrumental rationality. And this rationalization of social life involves an ever greater development of technical means and a progressive orientation of the ends towards which these, these means are supposed to lead. For, for example, for example, Weber argues uh, in the protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism that Calvinist and dissenting religion represented a rationalization of human behavior, which focused uh, on people's, uh, which focused people's co constant attention on the relationship between their everyday activity and their hope of salvation all behavior was scrutinized to see whether or not it represented a waste of time and thus possibly an indication that one was not destined for salvation. And, and, and such, such, um, and such uh, uh, obsession with making the most of each minute with the rationalization of everyday life particularly economic life gradually came to take uh, complete precedence over the intended goal, intended aim, intended uh, desired result, uh, um, uh, ambition um, uh, of demonstrating to oneself that one was likely to be destined for salvation. Okay? I mean, I mean Weber's analysis of, of the development of bureaucracy again is similar. Bureaucracy for Weber is simply the most technically efficient means of organizing the, the action of a state. Bureaucracy again is a modern phenomenon. Okay? Bureaucracy in capitalism is a modern phenomenon. Okay? This bureau, it does not imply that other forms of bureaucracy did not exist earlier in the pre-capitalist social formation. They were there, but but bureaucracy in capitalism again is different. Bureaucratic means of organization come to predominate in modern societies irrespective of the actual goals which they are supposed to serve. Increasingly, okay, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean uh, it implies that uh, um, increasingly bureaucracy takes on a life and a logic of its own that that renders its ultimate goal irrelevant. I mean, in Weber's terminology, formal rationality, the instrumental rationality of a particular form leads to substantive rationality. Okay? I mean, ends determine the means. Our objectives will determine what will be the possible methods that we are going to undertake. Okay? This is very important. Okay? Uh, then, uh, if, if in Weber's terminology that, uh, that, uh, mm, uh, that uh, formal rationality, the, the instrumental rationality of a particular form leads to substantive rationality. Uh, I mean a content uh, which is in fact derived from the form and not uh, from the goal that the formal rationality is supposed to serve. Okay? Uh, capitalism is itself, uh, capitalism itself is a very Im important instance of this general rationalization of behavior that characterizes modern society. Weber, Weber defines it in terms of the rationalization of the pursuit of profit. I mean, in economy and society, if you look at uh, Weber's exposition 
of such arguments that uh, you know, how he defines uh, uh, rationalization. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean this this rationalization of general rationalization of behavior uh, that characterizes modern society in terms of the rationalization of the pursuit of profit, a rationalization which ultimately implies that the individuals to whom this profit is accruing are not in a position to enjoy its possession, but must rationalize their own lives, replacing an aristocratic lifestyle based effectively on the service of profit rather than uh, its enjoyment. Once again, okay, uh, uh, if, if this is so, uh, then once again the means becomes the end. Weber's account of modernity as the progressive extension of rationalization okay, and his skepticism about the possibility of uh, reversing this trend makes this view of modernity at least effectively a holistic one. Okay. In holism or totality, what we discussed? He, Weber is not a straightforward holist, but through the lens of rationality, okay, Weber's account of modernity as the progressive extension of rationalization and Weber's skepticism about the possibility of reversing this trend makes his view of modernity at least effectively a holistic one. Okay. Uh, then let us quickly browse what we have discussed today. Okay. We started with Weber's interpretation of modernity through the lenses of holism or totality on the one hand and rationality on the other. Okay. Weber uh, is or rather became a sociologist because he is living and working as an academic at the point where sociology is developing as a separate discipline. Indeed, Weber moves from the study of law, political economy and history to an identity as a sociologist. And, and such shift has important consequences, Weber sets out to define sociology as different from other disciplines within humanities and social sciences and restricts its scope and ambit at least in theory and which, which, which uh, compels the reader, compels us to not to describe him as a holist. Okay? There are a number of steps that we have discussed in this narrowing of the jurisdiction of sociology of the scope and ambit of sociology. I mean the way Weber treats individuals as primary rather than relationships between individuals and a consequence of this is that these relationships uh, depend on active construction that they do not necessarily apply globally and that even where they do apply, they can best be described in terms of the probability that the relationship or process in question will apply in a particular case. And, and we have also discussed how Weber restricts the scope of sociology as a discipline to the study of meaningful social action in terms of value oriented, value rational social action and goal rational social action. Goal rational social action is alternatively known as instrumental rationality. Okay? Uh, that in, in this case, we as, as, as Weber restricted the scope of sociology to uh, uh, the study of only meaningful social action, Weber is not a straightforward, so, straightforward holist. Okay? But in the case of rationality, through the lens of rationality, we, we have learned how Weber, Weber's explanations are holistic in nature. Okay. We have discussed uh, in rationality that there is a tension between the statement that we start from individuals rather than relationships and the statement that we are interested in is the way those individuals orient their action to each other, in other words their interaction. The effect of this becomes clear when we consider the second element of Weber's definition of sociology that it is not just about social action, but about meaningful social action. Then we have discussed the way Weber developed a categorization of the types of meaning 
which can be attached to social action thereby he provided a uh, typology of social action namely uh, I mean four types of social action namely uh, traditional social action, effective social action, uh, affective social action or emotive social action, uh, value rational social action and goal rational social action. Okay. Out, out of these four uh, for Weber traditional social action uh, uh, and uh, effective or emotive social action are unreflective in nature uh, whereas, value rational and goal rational social action are, uh, are reflective in nature and, and hence they are meaningful social action. Um, and in fact, he uh, Weber uh, uh, emphasizes more on goal rational social action or instrumental rationality. We have also discussed how for Weber the history of modernity is the history of the progressive orientation of all social action in all contexts to instrumental rationality, I mean goal oriented social action. Okay. Then we have discussed how, how he argues that uh, 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 Calvinist and dissenting religion represented a rationalization of human behavior in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, then we have discussed Weber's uh, analysis of the development of bureaucracy uh, has also contributed to the debates on modernity. Okay. Uh, and then we have discussed how uh, capitalism itself is very important uh, of such general, general rationalization of behavior that characterizes modern society and Weber defines it in terms of the rationalization of the pursuit of profit or rationalization which ultimately implies that the individuals to whom this profit is accruing are not in a position to enjoy its possession, but must rationalize their own lives replacing an aristocratic lifestyle based effectively on the service of profit rather than its enjoyment. On, on once again the means becomes the end and Weber's account of modernity as the progressive ex, uh, extension of rationalization and his skepticism about the possibility of reversing this trend makes this view of modernity at least effectively a holistic one. Keeping this in mind, uh, in the next lecture we are going to discuss